it, really what it comes down to is um, there's there's always turf wars, right? In, in academia and in training, um, there's, you know, I remember even as a, a student, I started out in clinical psychology and I, I, I jumped ship over to, to ABA. Um, but as a clinical psychologist, you know, there, there was these big, this is where it all kind of started, these big debates on, you know, um, well, you know, if you're going to do X, Y, or Z, you've got to have a PhD, right? Um, and then, of course, all the, you know, professor, and I'm like, no, no, that's not true. You know, it doesn't really matter what you have, um, depending on, you know, for some, you know, uh, certain jobs. Now, it is true that if your, if your goal is to be a, a researcher, um, to be an educator, to do something like that, you probably have a better chance if you take the PhD route. Right. If your goal is to be a practitioner, it's tough to make this claim now because there's only one active PsyD out there. Um, but hopefully as more grow, we'll see a shift for, uh, or at least a, a new road for people who want to be practitioners to go down. Um, the fact of the matter is today in applied behavior analysis, if you want to be a practitioner, you just need a master's. That's it. I know people with their masters who, who work in their own clinics and uh, are making six figures. Okay. Um, I, when I first started teaching, I had students would come to me to help negotiate starting salaries and they'd complain they're not getting paid enough, but they were getting paid more than I am right with my PhD and my, they <laughs> says more about uh, my, my talents and where I ended up. But the, the point is you just want to make money, go do it. Right. You need your masters. So if you're going to go to this, place right to, to practice that you can do with a master's that higher degree has to offer you something special there's got to be a return on investment there that return might not be financial right but there's got to be something there um and, and when i say this it's not to knock on any phd programs i'm not saying phd programs don't already do this right there are phd programs that do excellent work turning out great practitioners. The question becomes, if you're so good at practitioners, you know, maybe there's some PsyD overlap or a focus that might be uh, more appropriate. Again, I'm not, like, it's hard to say that, you know, and, and be like, I'm picking on this place. I'm not, yeah. right? I don't think it's it comes just, up that way. If ours is a field of practitioners, shouldn't we be entertaining the practitioner doctorate? Well, and I think there's a, a dichotomy speaking about these, these misconceptions. Something that I hear from so many of our master's students is this, oh, I don't want to do research, I want to be a clinician. And this false dichotomy that you can't be both, um, that, that somehow practice does not involve research. And, and Ben addressed this really nicely earlier, that we need to be taking data, we need to be doing many studies on our own work. and. There are other frustrations that I see and, and that I have myself that so much of what is in our literature is coming out of these very siloed research laboratories, uh, and I'm guilty of this as well. Um, and practitioners in the field have a very tough time translating that into something that's going to be effective for their clients in their environment. Um, and there are a few clinics out there that do a great job of disseminating what they do in clinical practice, I would love to see more of that happen. I would love to see more practitioners have the time and the training and the desire to disseminate what it is that they're doing in the field, what is actually effective with the financial and resource restrictions that everybody's dealing with. Um, because that's really what's going to push the field forward, not you know somebody else with you know, three graduate assistants taking IOA, um, saying yeah this works great. I don't know why you can't get it to work in you know your classroom of twenty seven students. So that's that's something I'd really like to see the PsyD here and hopefully down the line elsewhere uh, start to really bridge. There's always this idea that PhD is better than PsyD, you know and. It, it, it just comes down to uh, what's best for you, right? Where do you want to go? And for some people, it is PsyD. For some people, it isn't. Um, 
Oh, uh, you know, the other thing I'd say too about the distinction is, you know, PhD is someone who's going to produce research. PsyD is someone who's going to consume research. And that's something I don't see much uh, discussed in our field at the moment, which is how do you bridge research to practice? Right. Um, I jokingly say to my students, uh, you know, life is not a Java article. And it's what we've been talking about, which is, you know, as Michelle was just saying, you can't have, you know, all this IOA going on in your clinic. It's too expensive. Right. Some people can pull it off. Some people can't. Treatment integrity is going to be weaker than you'll see in a research study. And if you try to model your clinic after a study, it's too expensive. Right. Do you get a better product if you're that tightly controlled? Absolutely. But do you do it at the expense of keeping your doors open? You know, and so this kind of critical consumerism, you know, how do you understand that just because something was written, it doesn't mean it's good. If I read something, how do I know, you know, if it is good, how do I know how to adapt it for my practice? Because who was in their study is not the person I'm dealing with. Right. And so um, how do we, get practitioners to very easily right because it's a skill you got to learn and it's a tough skill but in a very fluid fluent matter take this and say i recognize these important elements i can strip these out and bring them into my practice and then through monitoring our naturally occurring data i should see right those those increases um, and that that skill set is something um you know it's about critical consumerism but also uh, research to practice you know, i think those are the important important elements that, that are uh, bridged there. Well, in deciding whether those outcomes are sustainable, um, you can get incredible skill acquisition or 95% behavior reduction. But if that kid is leaving your clinic and one year later back in treatment at another clinic because all of that behavior has recovered, you haven't really done anything for that client. Um, and so looking at long-term sustainability of these gains, which we don't necessarily see reflected in the research literature, um, you can make anything look good for a week. So it's, it's how do you sustain it so that those gains are maintained and they can continue to advance. Is there other ways that you are trying to bridge this research to practice gap? St. Cloud? Uh, it's the focus of what the, the PsyD will be. Um, you know, we're having discussions right now, so nothing's solid yet, uh, you know, but the three of us are talking about, for the dissertation, having aspects of it be about, you should have to do a research component in a dissertation, making that about bridging research to practice, having coursework around, you know, how do you take this and, and adjust it? Um, I had an experimental class I did over summer where we did this and it was very effective. Um, and it was things like, how do you take behavioral skills training and bring it into the clinic in a, in a more efficient and effective manner? And we did that and it was, in a, it was a matter of um, pre-recording the models and having that available on like a YouTube channel that you could watch before your session. And then we were able to observe and we saw uh, a lot of improvement then in, in practitioner uh, execution, right? So a nice cost benefit way to bring in um, uh, behavioral skills training. We also looked at like discrete trials teaching and how do you make that, how do you adjust that for clinical practice? Um, now it's already in clinical practice, but what we were looking at was stuff like, well, we've all been there in discrete trials where you see like uh, after you get into the trials by the third one, the kid knows it and you know they know it and they know they know it. And now you've got like, depending on the clinic, days or weeks of the same target over and over and over and over and over again. Well, and then how do we adjust that? How do we let it so the kid can get out, right? How do you get out of that? So just taking these practices we have and saying, but what's my goal, right? And kind of flipping things on their head. So we're experimenting with that. Um, I'm writing a paper on that now. It'll probably get rejected like most of my work, but uh, <laughs> it's at least kind of fun. 
Hey, so this is just one of a series of videos that were sponsored by St. Cloud. Big shout out to them. They help me make more content, but this is just fantastic stuff that the field of behavior analysis really needs. If you want to contact them, you can actually book a Zoom session with the program coordinator. Sounds crazy. Yes, you can talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. There's also a link to learn more. Meet the team and then learn about that. So I'm Benjamin Witz and I'm a professor at St. Cloud State University. I'm the program coordinator. I oversee the, the master's programs. Uh, and the SID program, and I teach in the undergraduate programs as well. Michelle Traub, uh, assistant professor at St. Cloud State in the ABA program. Um, I also teach in the undergrad. I am the verified course sequence coordinator. I'm Odessa Luna. I am an assistant professor here in the ABA program at St. Cloud State. Uh, and, and this is my second uh, year, or going into my second year here, so the newest faculty member. The best thing to do is email me. We'll set up a time to chat over Zoom or something like that. Um, you know, I find emails are impersonal. Web forms are impersonal. You know, graduate school is all about you as a person and and fit. And you only get that in a conversation. That's great. I don't know anyone else that offers that. It wasn't offered when I went through my program. So, <laughs> and I'll see you in the next one. That's your daily BA.